how can I do a better job of serving today than I did yesterday, this year than last? As long as I can keep answering that question, I will continue to grow and mature as a person, and I'll never grow old in mind and spirit. <laughs> Once again, we got Mr. Copper Hot Step, man, from the UK joining us. 
for a, for a nice interview, man. Shout out to him for bringing this track through by Jungle Brown. Of course, if you like the vibe, subscribe to it. You know, the flow is real. I'm with it. You know, as you about to see, I'm about to subscribe myself because I like the music. So there you have it, folks. And uh, Copper Hot, man, what's up, big bro? Yeah, I'm good, man. It feels good to be home, bro. <laughs> I can't even like. <laughs> <laughs> Word, man. Word. So, you know, if you want to, man, we can get right into it. You know, everybody probably tensing up, waiting to see. If you want to, man, just share pretty much, uh, you know, your, your background, how you, you know, stay so studious, how you able to, you know, keep your, 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 your yourself as a man going and what actually, you know, keeps you driving to teach. Uh, the information that you do, man. So I'm a, I'm just gonna mute my mic, and you know, whenever I feel, you know, I got a question or whatever, I'll just jump in. But I'm gonna let you rock it out, man. Just kind of let the people know, you know, tell them, tell them what it is, bro. All right. Uh, yeah. What's good, people? Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Couple Hot Step, uh, but you can probably hear. Uh, I'm from the UK by means of I was born here, I was raised there, I've, I've predominantly always lived here. And uh, yeah, so I suppose for me starting out, my story was uh, basically my my parents are from the Caribbean, the West Indies, Central America. Um, and what happened was is that a lot of people from the Caribbean, from Central America, they uh, they came here in mass uh, because most of the economies out there were crippled by the British Crown, and a lot of people had to get up and go. And uh, the only choices were really North America or England to kind of escape the uh, financial depressions. And so many of us ended up coming over here. And this would have actually been uh, around the 1940s, the back end of the 1940s. Um, you had something called the Windrush in 1948. And this was the, the first predominant ship, uh, which carried a lot of people from Jamaica, Trinidad, um, and so Repeat forth. That one more time, bro. What ship did you say? Uh, the ship was called the Windrush. Okay. So the Windrush. So the people that came off that first boat are known as the Windrush generation. And they basically uh, traveled all the way from Central America to somewhere in England called Tilbury, which is where the ship docked. And um, they basically came here for a better life to um, to do better for themselves and their families. What happened was, in fact, a lot of the adults came and they couldn't bring uh, their families together with them at the same time. Uh, a lot of people got left behind and what happened is a lot of people had to come here first and they had to struggle and they had to really grind and dig deep and um, put money aside to be able to actually pay for the rest of their family to come over here after a set period of time. And um, so for me now, uh, my, my granddad is where my, my, my generation of people started off, so I'm third generation. So he was the first to come here and settle. Then he actually had to grind. He actually worked for Ford. Um, he worked in a Ford manufacturing plant in England here in London. And uh, he had to save up. And then he paid for the rest of my family to come over here. So he came first and then they came after. And then that's how my mom ended up here. And then subsequently I was born, you know. And um, yeah, so this would have been like the 1990s when I was born. So. Um, we we always have uh, a strong affiliation with you know the emerging pro black or pan African um, way of thinking or what was being taught around that time period. You know I always grew up knowing that um, you know slavery was a real thing, and uh, yeah we were just very heavy into like the Marcus Garvey and stuff like that. Um, it was really really big. Um, I think, yeah, I would probably say 1990, where it all really started to kick off here in England. I mean, my mum 
had already been exposed to Roots because basically Roots aired over here in the 70s. They were showing it on TV here in the 70s. Um, and that's how we that's how we got introduced to that concept of uh, slavery being a real thing when we first watched the the American the American TV series of Roots when it aired over here in Britain and England. That that's how really people started to identify with Africa in terms of living and growing up in England. And then um, we decided as you know time went on we wanted to reconnect more with that side of things and. We actually ended up going to you know so-called Africa like three times. I still remember uh, as a young and I went out there uh, to Tunisia in North Africa once, and um, we went out to the Gambia in West Africa twice. Um, it was meant to be to go and actually witness and take part in the, the you know so-called Kunta Kinte trail, and it's supposed to be the real trail that he walked or was you know forced to take from uh, his village to the shore where the boat allegedly took him away and so we we've done all of that i mean while i was out there in the gambia um i, I used to it, we used to interact with the locals and take part in some of their ceremonies and uh, i even ended up <laughs> doing something with my dad where basically you go off into like you know the outback with the, the men of one of the tribes and then um, you spend time with them and then they just basically teach you about their ways and stuff like that. And then uh, you actually get taught a, a dance that is indigenous to their tribe. And by nightfall, you have to then perform this dance, this ritual back to you know a whole entire crowd of tourists and locals and the president of the country. Um, <laughs> it's the weirdest thing dancing in front of like a president of a country and you're like seven, eight years old. It's, I don't know, it's really weird, bro. Like, I ain't gonna lie. But I did it. Um, and it was bad because I was like on national TV out there uh, the following day. But um, yeah, we've been out, you know, over there because that's what we wholeheartedly believed in. We truly believed, like, you know, at some point, somehow, some way, that's where our story started. So we right. made, a, you know, we made a big effort to not just, you know, to try and pretend about it we decided to be about it like to go out there and actually experience what the locals experience and um it's actually really interesting when uh you fast forward now and people are saying to you that you know caucasians are the original africans because if you go to tunisia there is actually um there's a province called Matmata, and basically in this place um, you have an official troglodyte community of people where they actually carve homes into the caves of the mountains that live inside of them and you can actually go out there and go into these homes and visit them and talk to them but yeah they, they live in caves oh, no, no. wait a minute okay because you already know now you use the old term that a lot of americans <laughs> a lot of americans might not know what that term is you said troglodyte right yeah okay can you explain what a troglodyte is for the people because i yeah. know what it is but yeah I, I, i'm glad you used that term because this is a uh this is a known term right yeah so uh troglodyte in the basic sense is just it's literally a person who inhabits you know a cave interior as you know their their place of sanctity their place of shelter and then boom, you said that they are in the Tunisia, uh, in the mountain areas. Yeah, they live in the mountainous regions of Tunisia, and it's just literally it's a whole range of mountains, open space, and like um, mountain range. And then they carve their homes into those those mountains. They carve cave homes into the mountains, and then live within them. Okay, so all right now how, how do you could you like was it a big population or was it just like just a few like um, it's uh in in contrast to the rest of the actual nation it's 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 a select few because you don't have the the rest of the people of the of the landmass that live that way it's just these people right. still remain in that capacity okay okay We'll, we'll continue on, bro. I ain't mean to cut you off. I just really no, want to. No, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I just wanted you to go in on that a little bit because you know I never heard of that. You know what I'm saying? And um, you know, I, I just think that's just something 
interesting to know, man, because, you know, this thing has been flipped around, like you said, you know, to 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 travel over there, you know. And how you so you you so you I mean, man, you know, a lot of us here, a lot of us that even uh, you know, have these panels, bro, haven't even been to Africa. So, you know. I mean, for you, you, you say it seems you've been a good, a, you know, at least a couple of times, man. So I, I you yeah. know, continue on with that if you don't mind, man. Sure. Uh, yeah, I yeah. Kinda, yeah, just go ahead. No, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. So yeah, Tunisia is in North Africa. Um, you know, predominantly your your main phenotype out there would be your so-called, you know, Caucasoid um, Arab people. Uh, they they make up the main populace of North. Africa in general, so it would be the same for you know your Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, um, Egypt, these type of places. But then obviously West Africa now, where I went to the Gambia, uh, this is your more what people will call black, so-called black or Negro people. And um, yes, and actually you have a difference of culture there within Tunisia compared to the Gambia. Um, but it was it was interesting. It was interesting to go to Tunisia and. Um, and to actually witness people that that live that lifestyle still to this very day, and then on top of that, it was it was refreshing to go to the Gambia and see the differences there as well. I mean, um, one thing that did always uh, stick in my mind to this very day. Um, actually, the second time we went to the Gambia, because I've been twice, um, I would have been a little bit older at that time, like you know, young teenage years. And my sister would have been a little bit older. There's a seven year gap between us. And we was out on the beach, like me, sister, parents, and me and my sister had gone off a little bit away from my parents, like to get closer to the water. And we were kind of just walking and talking. And then one of the locals must have spotted us and he came over to us to have a conversation. And then uh, <laughs> he must have overheard us talking. So then obviously he's heard my accent, he's heard my sister's accent. But the first question, he proposed to ask me was are you american so i was confused so i said to him no so he said oh where are you from so i said oh we're from england and then he said oh england okay yes i like england and then he started asking me about what english football team do i support and we started talking about that a little bit but then i remember always uh, i don't know i don't know why i just remembered it but i think i was meant to remember it because now it's like uh, Obviously now it is obvious to me when he asked that question, he's not asking me based on how my voice sounds. He's asking me based on how I look. Right, right. You know, because you know the my accent clearly doesn't ring from anywhere, <laughs> any state that you can find in, in North America. So I, I just find little things like that interesting from the trip that I had that I wasn't able to analyze properly back then that I'm able to reflect and I'm able to look back on now. So it's like even then it's like um you know they they clearly understand that um they, where, whatever accent you ended up having for whatever reasons they they can tell who is who and who is related to who and who isn't that's and right the point i i try to i try to stress them i try to point out with people is that um sometimes you have to give people more credit than what you'd like, you know, just because you may be ignorant to certain information doesn't mean that uh, the next man isn't. He's probably well versed in your history to some degree. And until you sit down and ask him certain questions that he's not used to being asked, then you'll never know for certain. That's right. And um, yeah, so um, yeah, it, going out to Africa was an experience, you know, it, it was all done under, um, it was done within good intentions because, you know, as, it, as, I, as I said, it's like we, we genuinely felt like that's, that's who we was in some aspect. And so kind of just carried on through life under that same train of thought. You know, you read in all the Pan-African books and textbooks and stuff like that. And then, um, yeah, it just happened to come to uh, last year even. So I've not known what I know long. I really haven't. Like in summer last year, um, I just happened to come across Dartman's channel. Just I don't know. It seemed like um, I don't want to say divine intervention, but maybe ancestral intervention, because he he just popped up. Like I used to be subscribed to a lot of you know Pan African YouTubers, not the heavy heavy predominant ones, but maybe you know your B list ones. Yeah. And 
and um, he, his channel just popped up in my recommended section just out of nowhere and it was a video about the truth about Jamaica and uh, obviously with a title like that I had to click it and watch it and it was weird because after I got done listening to that video everything he mentioned I'd never heard before but I just knew when I heard it and the video was done that he was telling the truth do you know what I'm saying and it, it's kind of like a weird feeling it's like you know um, it's like a low blow you know yeah, yeah. It's, like he, it's, it's, it's such a surreal feeling when you you hear this from the first time from one of your own people um and yeah it just kind of knocked me a bit like I, I knew it was true but i didn't know how to really feel about it because it's like obviously that's <laughs> that's not what they're teaching in school uh, that's not what's in the films um, that's not what's on the tv shows and it was just crazy for me and I just thought straight away, okay, I have to go away and start looking into this. There must be more. Because I, I come across one or two memes on Instagram. I had an Instagram account, like, you know, just the social one. Yeah. Like nothing, nothing in terms of passing on information or nothing. And I saw one or two memes about, you know, people from America really being Indian, stuff like that. And it did, you know, it did pique my curiosity a little bit. Because it's like, wow, because me, I'm just an open person uh, when it comes to information. And I think that's what's helped me. Right. Right. Because um, most people would see that stuff and just be like, oh, that's rubbish or, you know, oh, that's 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 a bunch of foolishness. Or, But for me, it's like, wow, that's weird. Like, um, why would somebody make that, do you know what I mean, and post that on social media? So my, my interest was already now, you know, get to the point of I need to start looking forward. So I made sure I subscribed to him, uh, started catching all of his videos, um, just started trying to digest all the information properly. And then from there, he, I started branching out to other other channels, other people that were putting out the same information. Um, I was looking at people on Instagram like Johnny Aborigine, people of that that caliber. Um, and then, like, yeah, after like two or three videos, that like, he just started to click. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, things were just becoming a lot more clearer. And I was um, I was able to go back to my mum after a while, after I, you know, a, a few months of, you know digesting that information and then I was able to start asking her questions to try and sync what I'd learned with my own personal experience through family lineage and then you know I asked her okay so mom um, I have the craziest thing to tell you but you know we're not from Africa right and it's just like oh well, what do you mean what makes you say that so I remember sitting down and explaining to her and my sister like everything that I'd learned and like they've, they've always been supportive so they you know, they, they understood that for me to come and address them with the information, then obviously, you know, I had no reason to just pull this out of the air and I must have gone away and, you know, right. spent some time on it. So they were very receptive to it and they said, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I asked my mom, okay, so how, how did we find out about me in Africa? I mean, did your, did your dad ever tell you about that? Yeah. And um, she was like, no, no, he didn't. Um, I found that out from Roots. <laughs> so I, I, I found out very quickly how we became African. You know, it wasn't very hard. <laughs> oh, hey, but hey, this is this is this is what this right here. What you just said. This is the effect that that movie put on. I would say ninety percent of our people, bro. Yeah, Look, man. I'm talking about across the. To rain, you know what I'm saying? Wherever that movie went, that movie played an effect on our people, man. And now, you know, we understand that, you know, when when I used to go in some of my my you know some of my people houses that would have a lot of these old books and stuff, and 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 they would say like, you know, you know, you want to make sure you know your history now. You know what I'm saying? Because they would always tell me, you know. Hey, we we ain't we don't know nobody from Africa. You know what I'm saying? Because I presented it to them. You know, it's, it's it's major, man. That that movie, and even still to this day, people will reference that movie to say that they are from Africa, man. And for you to say that, and 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 you know, hey, that's 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 a home run, like <laughs> like that's major major man but i'm glad you was able to you know get the info man and, and share it with your fam man because that's that's exactly what we trying to do and what we promoting the most you know what i'm saying you know youtube is fine and dandy but 
hey, you going to get with the real big dogs when you're really doing it with your family. You know what I'm saying? Because it's going to be felt and it's going to be noticed and, and the right people are going to find out. So the, the, the favor is, is, it, is in our hands, people. It's, it's a spiritual time right now. You know what I'm saying? And and y'all see, it's it's more to just this land of our, when it comes to our people. You know what I'm saying? We we do have people that's that that are like us or who are us. You know what I'm saying? Whether they are, you know, hey, he just told you, granddad, straight from America. You know what I'm saying? What 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 else is there else to say? I mean. Uh, now everybody else in the in on this you know on this planet not probably gonna be able to say that, but I mean even if they can't, if they really for progressing our people and really trying to help better the cause to 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 you know giving people the ability to, to do better and, and be better, I'm all for you and I'm gonna connect with you, man. So that that right there was deep, yo. You know what I'm saying? For you to be way and. The UK and roots have an effect on some people, man. I mean, it, it just says a lot, man. It does, man. It really does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, it, it was, um, <laughs> it was a, it was a, it was a. Um, how can I say? It? it was a, it was a master plan to stay inside the mind, so that you know, wherever the American travels, the lie would travel with them. That's right. And, right. Um, yeah. Um, so, when, yeah, she just um, when I started getting into it with her, then she was like, "Yeah, um, I we learn about being African from white people, not from Africans." So, yeah, that makes sense that they'd be lying. And uh, you know, that's that's just the truth of the situation. We can't really make it any other kind of way because you know, uh, to be honest with you, um, we were the first wave of so-called migrants of um, you know any any species of people other than you know indigenous english people to actually come to these shows and and to build up this economy and this way of life here because uh, my mom even ver verifies for it and said you know when she first arrived here when her grand when her dad would have arrived here which was my granddad there were only two types of people living in england he was either an english person or he was a so-called carib person you know there was no other ethnic groups of people mm. Damn. So yeah, you walked out in the street, you was only gonna see either your kinfolk or an English person, and that was it. Everybody else came about 20, 30 years later once all the hard work could be done and we kind of paved the way. So and that's, you know, that's exactly what what a lot of uh disruption it was either what was it earlier this year or late last year they were saying uh something about how uh it was something that was supposed to be going on it, with exactly what you was talking about dealing with how the uh caribs that that was, they took over they built up all that stuff you know as far as the for the the economy and everything but yet they gave it was they gave the they gave it the credit to the it wasn't the caribs put it like that they try to get <laughs> that sounds about right <laughs> that's, that's something like yeah. that <laughs> but yeah, yeah, when we first arrived there, we were doing, um, you know, the 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 backbone jobs of the nation. You know, um, the, the 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 nursing jobs. Our women did the nursing jobs. Um, our men did the um, industrial type jobs, like the the bus driving jobs. Um, a lot of us went and fought in both world wars as well. So we were really putting in work, like as soon as from the moment we got here. And um, yeah, when we first got here, we were very close knit because obviously as soon as we got here, our, we were public enemy number one. Um, and that meant that uh, we had to really tribe up and be for each other and have each other's backs because, you know, there was a lot of sentiment towards us being here. Um, still is now uh, to some effect. Um, and then, you know, the police were like, you know, the biggest gang going. I mean, they still are now from the time we arrived, you know. Um, they were they were actively dealing in the mistreatment of us when we first got here. And they, again, they're still doing it now. Um, and the only gangs that were <laughs> existing at that time in England were the English people, because 
because they had gangs that was specifically uh, targeting our people and running them down in the streets and, you know, beating them almost half to death. Um, yeah, it was crazy. Uh, they were the only gangsters at that time period. We were the workers that were, you know, trying to keep things afloat. Right. They, they were the original gangsters. I mean, we only became gangsters, you know, on, on the turn of things after, you know, we'd settled here more and we'd had time to become, you know, indoctrinated and, okay, well, you're black, so that means you're a gangster and this is your lifestyle that you've got to live as a black person. And, you know, they, they, they award you um, your, you know, your character based on what they decide you are. And they obviously they program that into you, and then now you fast forward now, and now we're suddenly the the face of you know crime. And but I mean it wasn't always like that. It was a process. This was a gradual process. So they but, literally uh, they literally call y'all blacks instead of Caribs when they know y'all. Are... Actually, well you know they, I mean they if you're if you're so called Carib or, or African, you're you're just seen as black or sometimes black British or. But, you know, um, they they still, you know, on TV and in media still refer to us as West Indians sometimes as well. So they just like to deviate between all these different names that they've come up with. But, you know, they've never called us African Caribbeans. I mean, they tried to do that, but no one really gravitated to the word. Um, it's just kind of there in the background as a kind of, well, it was a failed attempt, but they try and bring it out every now and again uh, for academic purposes. But I mean, they, it's not something they really heavily stand on. And I mean, the census that, uh, or any paperwork that you fill up here uh, in the black section, it would always have, um, you know, are you black African or are you black Caribbean? Um, or are you black other? If you see yourself as a black other group, you know, there's no just one inclusive group where black is black and that's it. So they're even showing you there, like there's a clear difference between the two of you because it, they could have really just put you all into one bracket. I mean, it's kind of like a double-edged thing they're doing because they're, they're trying to put you in one black here by saying black, but then they're still differentiating in there. You know? So that's, that's the biggest clue. You know, if you were the same people, they want to do that. Mm. You know, you would just have one, you would have one, one racial category that fits all, you know, one size fits all kind of thing. That's right. So I point that out to people as well. So I'm like, okay, so, you know, if this is true, which box do you tick as your ethnicity when it comes to paperwork? And then they say, oh, Black Caribbean. I'm like, well, why did you do that? You know, if, if what they say is true, then you are an African who was misplaced in the Caribbean. So shouldn't you be ticking the African box? Right. And then they say to me, oh, no, 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 I'm Caribbean. I'm like, well, you can't be, you know, two people can't fit in one body. You were only given one body at birth. So which one are you going to have? But then I use all of these examples to try and just get people thinking about stuff in just, you know, general uh, chit chat conversations that I might have with people that they're, they're stuck on certain things. But um, yeah, as for me, um, I just kept going forward, started reaching out to lots of people over your side, where you're at. Um, and I started slowly finding people that are located over here. Because at first, <laughs> I didn't think I was going to find anybody living over here with me. <laughs> but I, I was patient. And then I came across uh, Copper Fox, the Zan, and she's probably the first person I spoke to over here properly. I just happened to meet her through a DMX live stream, and then she must have phoned me afterwards, so we were talking for a good minute or so, right, just about this, that, and everything. And then after a while, we came across uh, Gambler, and then he came on board. And then I came across Sword, and then he came on board. And then fast forward now, and then at the turn of this year, um, yeah, the group was pretty much sorted, you know, we had a, like a nice little group of people that are over this side who are, you know, very passionate about information and um, want to do better with it and just being able to just uh, build with them just, you know, after a long day at work and just share information and just have laughs and, you know, just kind of evoking that kind of old energy of just, you know, being about, um, being about enlightenment and just, you know, enjoying the moment and, because obviously we were doing all of these things, you know. You know, we were we were lazing about, we were having jokes, we were around the fire, we were exchanging, you know, ancient information. And that's that's kind of what the group does now. We just try to embody that every day that that, uh, that we have, you know, this time that we've got in this realm. So um, I've been able to learn a lot of things through them. Um, and then they've really pushed me on to have a channel now where I'm actually just here and just 
uh, putting forward information that I've come across either personally or that has come to my attention through another good source. And um, yeah, same for same for Lacona as well. Like um, we had a lot of encouragement from the group and from other people outside the group to actually come on this YouTube and this whole YouTube game and start making content and start putting stuff out there. And um, so it's been a nice journey for us as well to actually have active channels and uh, we're trying to encourage the rest of the group to do the same and to start getting some content out there. But we just we enjoy the interaction with like other people out there who think the same way as us. I just I just challenge myself now every day. I ask I try and ask myself um, difficult questions um, in pertaining to you know our history or just history in general. Right, and that's right. usually a good starting point for me, and that can usually take me on a good tangent for you know upcoming shows and stuff like that. Like it's kind of like you know the whole hypothesis you know method. You go away, you develop your hypothesis, you test it. And then you bring your results and it's kind of the same thing that I, I try and do for my show. So I try and sit down and say, well, if they say this and this happened, then can I challenge that? And then I just, you know, be on Google, just type in keywords and stuff like that. And if I catch an angle, then I just run with it. And then I see, can I build on that now? And this is a lot of ways how my shows come about just from that. Just, you know, always never being, um, never being static. And just, yeah, just always challenge yourself every day. Always ask yourself something difficult of what you think you know and to see if you can improve on it. That's right. That's how you, that's a, one of the great techniques to move forward and and keep yourself sharp, man. And, and like I say, man, I appreciate what you have brought, you know, whether you known this information all your life or just in the past year or day. Some people just have a vibration and an energy that know how to connect things and know how to bond with people. And these are the type of people that, that need to be, you know, known to the world and, and to, you know, our people so we can connect, man. And, you know, I already discussed with you, you know, I'm, we, I'm trying to put together trips and all. So, you know, the UK, we, we, it's going down, you know what I'm saying? And, of course, we are gonna try to get y'all over here too, you know. And and of course, no one may know but us. But hey, it's going down. <laughs> <laughs> and, hey, it's, it's it's just about keeping it moving forward and progressing. Like you say, keep keep asking the questions that, like you say, need to be answered. But no one can can really find an answer to. And this is what we've been doing. You know, I'm pretty sure you, as a youngin. You know, seeing all them different ventures, going to different countries and stuff like that, that you were able to witness and see the different ideology, cultures, and the way people are in general. You know what I'm saying? And I, I know that was a, that that helped you to open your mind a lot more. And I know that's something that our people definitely have to do more of, and that's why I, I promote that also. So, yeah, definitely because um, you know even even when I just sit down here, I just pay very close attention to how my people behave in contrast to how the people behave who they say, you know, I, I and my people allegedly descend from. And you literally, you won't see two more different birds in the sky. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, and it's just, it, there's too many differences um, to ignore that you can't, you can't possibly ignore. That's right. Um, it's just, it, it, it just comes down to everything, the music, the food, um, athletically, what we excel in compared to what the other might excel in or not excel in. Um, there's just there's just too many um, unique, um, separate qualities that don't correlate, you know, and have no, you know, cognitive qualities. Um, and this, this also helped me as well because, you know, I realized I wasn't maybe paying as much attention to my surroundings as I should be. And... Um, now I'm able to just, I'm able to just, you know, quietly assess the world in front of me. You know, everybody's running around, going to work, going to the shops, going to wherever. And this mm -hmm. is the best time to catch people in their natural element. And you will learn, I tell people, before you even pick up a book, before you listen to a live stream or read a John Ogilvy book, you can literally sit on a park bench and That's just, right. you know, close your mouth and say nothing and do That's nothing right. and watch the world go by and, you quickly find out who you're related to and who you're not. 
That's right, man. And I'm proud to say, man, I already know spiritually, you know, and on a mental level, because of course we never met physically, but I already know, man, you fam. And everybody else that's with you too, LaSun, DJ Gambler, you know, Lacono, you know what I'm saying? Everybody, man. We all family here, man. So it's it's, yeah. it's really just just keeping it like that. You know what I'm saying? All this uh territorial static, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, that's only for when you gotta deal with your area and your individuals. But when we all come together, we gotta all bring it together. And and this is what it's about, man. So Yeah, and I, I know we spoke about it uh, uh before this call even happened. And uh it's it's literally uh people have to understand that it's it's a case of you you wasn't beaten or defeated by a by a master or a master as they tell you you was you was out tricked by an opportunist there's a big difference you know they clearly couldn't beat you in speed they couldn't beat you in physical prowess so they had to beat you in the mind that's right um, and by beating you in the mind meant um, you know they had to go to the drawing board well what is what is the makeup of all indigenous people on every landmass they are very territorial very tribal they have no continental affinities whatsoever i mean you go to australia you can go to africa you can go to melanesia no one identifies under a singular body or a continental concept you know continental theories or uh, ideologies are you know a a modern european invention from the 1600s so continents as an idea haven't even really been around that long um so they they knew that by giving you a continental identity they, they're actually damaging you they're hurting you right because they know that goes against the code of being a natural firstborn person to the planet so then they say okay this is africa uh, and now they can use you know the concept of skin to now tie every indigenous person to there and now you know you're you're damaging a whole realm of people and now that's where opportunity sinks in well i can tell this tribe that oh well if you don't like that tribe i can give you 50 guns and some tobacco and i'll help you get rid of them and then after you've helped them get rid of them then you know they slaughter you they take your right. land they take the land you just help them take they move further inward so you know they're just getting further and further to the middle and now by the time they've reached the middle now they've decimated most of you and um now you know all of a sudden it's not indian country or america now it's america and they're americans you know, and on top of that, now they're 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 whites. Now they're Brits. They're Europeans. They're Jews. They're Africans. They're Jesus. They're all of these things. But you know, you can only come from one place now. Because remember, they say to you that you know, if we were all the same, the world would be such a boring place. But then they turn around and say, well, we are from all these places, but you're African. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And that's, 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 you know, that's, yeah. that's the irony, you know, they, they tell you that, you know, the world would be such a boring place if we was all the same. And it's like, okay, so I'm not the same as the next man over there. Clearly you came here and you met me already. Like, stop playing games. You know who I am. And they're like, no, no, no. We're, we're all of these things, but you're African now. That's it. Like, it's not up for debate. That's right. It, this is, this is what people need to understand is literally, it's nothing for these people to switch a name of a, of a land. And just you know, accredit a people to it. Exactly. In the hopes of getting rid of you know their understanding of who they are. That's they're doing worse things than that. So people can't get caught up on names and and semantics. Like they've been conquered that concept already. That's it, man. You just broke down the game that they use and still use to this day, man. And now they got our own people. Some of our own people using it against us man and this is this is what's this is what's i say man it's a done deal with that though because we really just tearing all that apart i mean i really haven't pretty much seen a rebuttal on anything yet now i'm seeing i'm seeing uh <laughs> i'm seeing uh channels people talking about why why you don't want to be african <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Golly, man. You know, if I was, I rep that. But even yeah, if I had, it, like, you are, like this is what we, this is what we're saying. It's like, look, if we were genuinely from there, like that's the whole point. We genuinely, you know, with all our heart, felt we were from there. 
So we made our whole lives about that and people can't deny that we didn't do that because we're still doing it today. So obviously for us to come away from that can't be a thing of self-hatred, you know what I'm saying? Obviously we found something that contradicts the status quo of things. So it's, you know, it's almost 2019. If, if people are still talking these things, then, you know, either A, you're still not paying close enough attention or B, <laughs> you're working against us just like we experienced <laughs> before, you know? <laughs> you know, the same Indians that sold out for an umbrella and a pair of shoes. You know, same thing. That's right, man. But, yeah. you know, it's funny because uh, we uh, we don't really get any knowledge of American history whatsoever over here. Um, you literally go through the, the schooling system, learning predominantly about, you know, whitewashed Europe. Um, you learn about the pale kings and queens, and they're not telling you that, you know, around, you know, good 15, 1600s, the royalty would have still looked like me and you. That's right. So they don't even tell you, like, obviously they're not going to, it doesn't fit their agenda to tell you these things. And this should be something else that people should be able to pick up on, you know. Uh, if you was really African, why would uh, why would they give that information to you for free of charge, and you didn't even have to ask for it? Exactly. And why would you know? Why why, why would a, a predominantly Ashkenazi uh, film Hollywood um, industry? Why would they spend millions upon billions of dollars to make films to help you understand who they who you are, and not teach about their own people and the Holocaust and their history? You know what kind of man does that? Exactly, man. <laughs> that's this game at its fullest. <laughs> I mean, you know, Jackie, if I if I want to if I want to keep you under my boot, the last thing I've got to do is give you free information to help you understand who you are. So one day you could just whoop me. And whoop yeah. Me this. You know that would be bad war tactics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just go. We just go take over, but then we're gonna give you everything you need just to get it back. <laughs> It's insane. So, you know, this, this, this information that's come forward is not well spoken of. So that should, that should be a clue in itself, you know, that something's not right, that something must be wrong. Something must be terribly wrong. Because like I said, you didn't have to ask for this. Um, you didn't have to go to any of your family and say, okay, so uh, which, which Ashanti village did they snatch us from? They, they're giving that to you free of charge. You didn't even have to ask for it. That's right. And uh, you can't, you know, you can't live life by juxtapositions. You can't complain that these people have don't have your best interests at heart, but you think that somehow um, they're going to give you, you know, gems and drops. It doesn't, it doesn't compute. You know, the same way how um, you can't, you can't say ancestry DNA is a hundred percent kosher, but these people have infiltrated, you know, all industries and corporations <laughs> in modern society. You know, is, is ancestral DNA not a modern corporation in modern society? So have they not infiltrated that as well? Right, man, because, and, you know, big up to uh, Phoenix Moon, you know, I know she was just allowing someone who was in the field of DNA studies to uh, speak. But, we, you know, I think people got to realize, you know, this is someone who is, you know, technically still active and and uh, you know under you know the the institution or the indoctrination of you know modern day science. So uh, she really believes she she thought she think it's okay to take a DNA test pretty much, and she was promoting for twenty three and Me, and I was trying to ask the questions. You know, I called a few times, or whatever, but I kind of felt like I wasn't gonna get no. <laughs> I, I felt like I wasn't gonna get in anyway, but uh, I just yeah. wanted to ask her, you know, well, uh, what 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 is DNA actually uh, going to do for us by taking this test when really doing our paperwork or just the fact that we already know? Period. You know, we pretty much broke down the fact that it's not even accurate, and I, she was kind of promoting it on the sense that since there's a loophole that they've allowed for people to know that you should go ahead and uh do 23 and me and i'm like well that's you know for people who really already know what dna is really about i think we should 
you know, I think we could kind of look over that to actually see what she was saying because she did give a good <laughs> breakdown. But uh, yeah. I think, it's you know, yeah, it was interesting with the teeth and stuff. Yeah. 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 And um, yeah, that whole DNA thing, because I knew at some point I wanted to get into DNA. Um, and uh, I went away and put the show together. And um, yeah, like the council, they never know what my shows are going to be about. It's always a surprise of the day when I go live. So they're, they're literally experiencing it along with the rest of you guys. But um, one thing I did present, I, I can I can show you guys now, is um, an actual study. I mean, the people that watched that episode, they will have seen this already, but I know some of your, your peeps might not have. Um, there, there's a paper on the genetic um, makeup of the Adam and Islanders and it's it just blows the whole dna thing just you know the africa thing out of the water you know um i'm gonna bring it up now all right go ahead i'm gonna meet my mic all right so uh, let me go to this question yeah because this this was like you know i i, I kind of felt like you know she she made good points you know what I'm saying? But it's still a lot of people who don't really know about the DNA uh, technology, you know what I'm saying? Because these DNA companies still allow pharmaceutical companies to uh, receive your information after you give your DNA up, man. It's, it's in the fine print, you know what I'm saying? And I was like, you know, I, I made a comment in the chat and I was like, well, I don't want nobody to just do whatever with my information and she i heard her made a comment and say well they already got you in your dna when i'm like well so what's that about <laughs> i did hear that as well a lot of people have said that as well that, okay if you're going to the hospital or you went to hospital they've got it already but you know it, it's still kind of besides the point now right i mean that doesn't mean i'm supposed to let you give it to whoever you want to give it to you right. know even if you do i don't know that anyway you know what right. I'm saying? So what kind of what kind of answer was that? You know, she really she lost me then. You know what I'm saying? But I know she gotta defend her doctrine and she she probably under some oath as a doctor or whatever, so she can't exactly speak against, you know, the medical uh CDC or whatever you wanna call the crap. You know what I'm saying? But my thing is, you know. We just got to make sure we pay attention when we actually listening to people. And I, but I know our people already kind of was on that. But you know, I just I just had to throw that out there. But go ahead, bro. I ain't gonna cut you off. All right. So um uh yeah. So am am I sharing my screen at the moment? Yeah, yeah. I got it on yours now. Yeah. All right. All right. So basically, yeah. I, I mean, most people probably already know what the Adam and Island people look like. So here they are. Um, and basically what I found just through digging around, I actually came across this. Um, this is the genetic origins of the Adamant Islanders. And this is the US National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health. This was published online um, 2002, December 11th. Uh, okay, so the abstract says, uh, mitochondrial sequences were retrieved from museum specimens of the enigmatic Andaman Islanders to analyze their evolutionary history. So D-loop and protein coding data reveal that phenotypic similarities with African pygmoid groups are convergent. Uh, genetic and epigenetic data are interpreted as favoring the long-term isolation of the Adamanese extensive population substructure and or two temporarily distinct settlements. An early colonization featured populations bearing mitochondrial DNA lineage M2. And this lineage is hypothesized to represent the uh, phylogenetic signal of an early southern movement of humans through Asia. So the results demonstrate that Victorian anthropological collections can be used to study extinct or seriously admixed populations to provide new data about early human origins. So I'm gonna go to the interesting part, which things that I'm not Okay, so, and we get to this bit now. And then it goes on to say, so the protein coding region sequences produce clear results with no ambiguities and showed that all 12 specimens possessed 1040T, 
and 10398G, placing them in the Asian M. haplo group and ruling out an African origin. So again, they said these people, they took their DNA. Okay, then. Done it, tested it. <laughs> <laughs> they said uh, these people have the Asian You might have to read that again. You might have to read that again. Yeah, so they said uh, uh, the protein coding region sequences produce clear results with no ambiguity, so there was no confusion about what they found and showed that all 12 specimens of the Adamanese people they're talking about possessed 10400T and 10398G, placing them in the Asian M. Haplo group and ruling out an African origin. So they're saying they've, they've done DNA testing on these people and found that they're not from Africa. They've done this already. And you know what? And I was telling people, man, I still I still haven't found my book, but I know it was uh, Yoruba culture and history and, and language. And it was telling you how most of the uh, North West Africans and Northern Africans are from Asia. OK. Word, man. It's in Asia, Arabia and uh 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 saudi uh arabia in those areas that's what they, that's what their book was telling me yes yeah, that's, that's a fact that's, yeah. that's where they come from it's true because uh, people have to understand you know they, they're not spitting in test tubes to find out where they specifically came from in the world that's done through oral you know legacies that's crazy man that's, that, that is a trait of indigenous existence you know uh, the oral, the oral, the oral passing on of the the people's story, um, you know, that that that's that's what indigenous people do. They don't spit in troops to verify things. And you and you just proved, basically, through the, their own DNA uh, little sequence there that, yeah, these people uh, and in that group in the uh, you know in that area were from the uh, Hablo group Hablo group of Asia. I mean, that's that's just it just confirms more of everything because they're actually trying to uh, go back to the out of Asia theory, supposedly uh, right now in modern science. So, I mean, <laughs> this is I mean, man, I mean, I don't, you know, and see, that's why I say, man, you know, we got to pay attention. I people, you got to make sure we pay attention to information. It really don't settle for you know we got to know who's speaking what they represent and what they stand for and go from there you can't take all information as heavy weight or as solid information because they may be uh, affiliated or associated with somebody and i'm glad you put that out there like that that was a tomahawk <laughs> Bro, you can't believe how lucky I felt when I found that. I was like, no way is this just sitting up on the internet like that. <laughs> but it just goes to show, like, I tell people, look, if I could do this stuff, I mean, I'm not, I'm not no one's teacher. I'm not nobody's scholar. I'm not anybody's, you know, um, master priest or nothing like that. I'm just, I'm just somebody that just decided that I care enough to just, you know, right. challenge myself. Over. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's, yeah, it's not that deep. Like, you know, I'm not. You know, I'm just not that kind of guy. Like I'm just, I'm just a regular guy like the rest of you who has internet and Wi-Fi. You know, to put it bluntly. Dang. So you know, any one of us can do this, man. This, this is. It, it seems daunting at first when you first come across this stuff, but right. Right. you just have to dedicate yourself to it, and it, it becomes easier. It just becomes so, so easy after a while. That's right. It made too much sense after after a while. It's like that's why you gotta make sure you travel and, and, and keep yourself attached to you know attached to, to, to some type of grounding on earth. You know what I'm saying? Because this information can pretty much, you know, take you away from the way of the world. You know what I'm saying? And uh, uh, it's it's good to stay in touch with each other. Keep each other motivated and uplifted, 
like I say, it's better when you can really share it and make it easier for your household because it, it, it keeps you, you know, so your head won't be in the clouds. You know, this for all the people who, you know, who who so open that they just soaking in, soaking in, soaking in, you know, still enjoy yourself and still do what you do, man, because you're going to miss out on a lot, you know, not doing that. and and. You gotta yeah. keep this fun, but this is just to show everybody that we ain't the only ones that's been oppressed, man. And and it's not all about just us. We may be finding a lot of root bases, you know, here in America, but you know, we gotta really learn how to connect and and learn each other's, you know, psychology so we can yeah unify the correct the correct way, man. So. Yeah, the key is just, you know, not not always taking things within a literal context because the same way you can't just take the name of a landmass today as, you know, the gospel. You can't take the people you meet on a landmass as gospel, you know. That's when, right. When, when, you, when you've done enough, when you've been around information long enough and you've, you've soaked it up, you know, like a sponge, then you'll quickly start to see that, you know, that applies to people. Just because you see somebody in a place that is being called today Africa, it doesn't even necessarily mean they're from the Eastern Hemisphere in origin, because we now know that there are people in Africa <laughs> who are from the West and they're still there today. And they've, they've gone as far as to um, award themselves um, very specific names for their people to, you know, dist distinctly cut themselves away from the indigenous to show that they still held on to that understanding of being from the West. Like you've got the uh, americo Liberians. I mean, why would they call themselves that if they were really Africans? That's right. And then you've got the Creole people of Sierra Leone. I mean, we know that Creole is the word that was created by the so-called Negroes. So again, why would they call themselves the Creole people and be Africans? You know, these again, these are things you just can't overlook. You just can't. That's right, man. And, and, and I'm glad you said that because some people probably didn't know that. You know what I'm saying? And this this is what it's about, man. And hell, if you want to, man, you you can. Um, uh, get into your ecology uh, if you want, man. If you had anything, because I know that's part of your uh expertise, man. If you can kind of, you know, I guess share some of that what you did see in Africa as far as how the land was and yeah. even how y'all land is over there. You know, yeah. just you know, just anywhere you've been, man. You already know. Let's get it, man. All right. Um. Yeah. No. No problem. Um. Yeah, I did notice that um, when when I did spend time in both uh, North Africa and, and West and West Africa, um, it's a very different terrain compared to when I've gone back home to visit Yamaka, for example. You know, Yamaka is very plush. You know, typically very picturesque, very tropical. Um, lots of green, lots of um, you know vegetation and things growing. Very mountainous. You know, um, and there's lots going on. But in you know in so-called Africa, whether it's north or west, the land is very sparse. And um, again, this uh, this led me down a road of my second episode where I was chatting about uh, food of the world and where does it all really come from. And I was even getting into um, African agriculture and how it's um, you know critically uh, analyzed today. And they will even tell you today that um, agriculture in Africa is still very primitive. In the year 2018, is it's not at a very advanced level compared to the Americas, for example. It just doesn't compare. So straight away, you know, a a person who's thinking in the right way could say, you know, if 600 out of 640 crops that are found in that so-called place called Africa today um, wasn't in, you know, autonomous or autonomous to those people and their land, uh, you know, life could definitely 100% not have started there because that meant that you know man would have died and starved to death within five minutes and none of us would be here today to <laughs> be talking on hangouts you know um and just the fact that because the land is um, not as productive and fertile as the americas as well again um if we'd all started off there with dead land and um only eight you know eight percent crops to to play around with we would have starved to death a long time ago nobody would be here right now Mm. Now that's major, man. 
you know, obviously life would have had to have started where all the vegetation was, where the food was. You can't, you, there'd, 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 there'd be no way you manifest here and have nothing to eat. That would, you know, that's just, creation doesn't work like that. That's right. Existence doesn't work like that. That's right, man. And, and that's just like how you said, um, you know, you can either kind of, you know, some of these, if you look at an updated uh, ecology, uh, you know, landscape, you know, map or whatever, you can you can kind of tell because, you know, they give you the oxygen levels or the, the density of the forests and stuff like that. And it's, it's pretty obvious, you know, the, 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 the oxygen, the, the density of the oxygen in Africa is, is mostly coming from South Africa. Yeah. And then but you look at the Americas, you got, of course, uh, now, a lot of the uh, density is coming from the, the jungles of the, uh, Guatemala, but it's density everywhere. You know what I'm saying? The, the, it's, it's, it's heavy oxygen almost everywhere. It's just a few mm -hmm. areas that's, you know, like New Mexico and stuff like that, Arizona or whatever, and a little bit of uh, Mexico where you have some, some dry areas, but even then, you know, we still had irrigation systems in those areas. We still had uh, uh, plants that was in there. And I know you're going to get into that, man. So I ain't going to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, me, me, me and Jackie were talking about two nights ago. Uh, we were talking a little bit about plants and whatnot. So, um, again, I, I like a challenge. I like going away and looking at new stuff. And it actually led me to a website that I'm going to, to show you guys right now. I'm just going to go into the screen share. <clears throat> so it actually led me to this website, uh, desertusa.com, and on here they actually uh, they talk to you in detail about all the different wildflowers, cactus, and succulents, trees, shrubs, and grasses that are found within uh, the desert, the, the desert regions of North America, and uh, and it actually tells you how, you know, the American Indians were using some of these as well, which I wasn't expecting to find. So, again, this was a nice little thing right here. So I just pulled up a few examples just to go over. So, for example, here you've got the California fan palm. So now it's going to tell you for the range. Um, it occurs naturally in desert oases in isolated areas of the Sonoran and Moje deserts of southeastern California, uh, southwestern Arizona, and northern, um, is that Beja? Egypt, California, Mexico, at elevations between 500 and 1,000 feet. So widely cultivated as an ornamental in Southern California. Um, and then the habitat it says moist soils along alkaline streams and in mountain uh, canyons. I want to show you like how it was used. Uh, yeah, here we go. So let me blow this up a little bit. So it's a bit small. So the California fan palm was an important resource for the Kahula Indians of Southern California, who called it Mao. They used it for food, especially the fruit nuts, which they ground up as a flower or made into a mush. They also soaked the fruits to produce a sweet beverage and made jelly from the fruit. Uh, trees produced a dozen or so such date clusters at five to 20 pounds each. So they were getting jelly from this the same way you get jelly from a coconut in the Americas, you know, same principle. Um, the spongy pith in the center was sometimes boiled and eaten and was called Mao Passan or Heart of the Palm. Uh, the fan palm was also used for construction, fronts for roof thatch, and leaves were stripped and used in various weaving applications. So the hard seeds uh, that fell after fruit pulp dried were the preferred fill for gourd rattles and were better than stones or other seeds. The desert kahula also preferred the fan palm for making sandals. So fire making tools as well as tinder were made from this palm. So the original California fan palm oasis were important gathering and habitation sites and were indi in, wait, indicative of important springs. So usually located along earthquake faults. And some of these included Thousand Palms, Palm Canyon and Andreas Canyon. And then if we go on to this one now. So this is the mesquite tree. and. Uh, 
So um, during the inevitable droughts and deprivations of desert frontier days, mesquite trees served up the primary food source for caravans and settlers. So the mesquite beans became manna from heaven for the suffering men of the 1841 Texas Santa Fe expedition, said George W. Kendall. Uh, in his journal, when our provisions and coffee ran out, the men ate mesquite beans in immense quantities and roasted or boiled them. So during the Civil War, when groceries often ran short, mesquite beans served as passable coffee. So mesquite blooms pollinated by bees yield a connoisseur's honey. Mesquite is the most common shrub small tree of the desert southwest. Like many members of the legume family, mesquite restores nitrogen to the soil. There are three common species of mesquite. You've got the honey mesquite, you've got the screw bean mesquite, and then you've got the velvet mesquite. And then again, if I go to the uses now. Um, okay, so mesquite beans durable enough for years of storage became the livestock feed of choice when pasture land and grasses failed due to drought or overgrazing. They were carried by early freighters who fed the beans to their draft animals, especially in Mexico. Uh, although often crooked in shape, mesquite tree branches, stable and durable, filled the need for wood during the construction of Spanish missions, colonial haciendas, ranch houses, and venting. Its wood served artisans in the crafting of furniture, flooring, paneling, and sculpture. Of the tree mesquite, said Doby, there is one kind of yellowish wood and another of a deep reddish hue as beautiful when polished as the richest mahogany. So in some areas, mesquites provide a bountiful harvest of wood for use in fireplaces and barbecue grills. So the mesquites requiring little water and only low maintenance have found a place in Southwest Xeriscaped gardens and parks. They not only produce beans and blooms that attract wildlife, they provide perches and nesting sites for birds, including hummingbirds. So I didn't even know you guys had hummingbirds out there, so that's something new for me as well. Um, in the frontier days, according to Dobie, mesquites were used by the Indians and the settlers as a source of many remedies for a host of ailments. Indians and settlers believed tea made from the mesquite root or bark cured diarrhea. Boiled mesquite roots yielded a soothing balm that cured colic and healed flesh wounds. So mesquite leaves crushed and mixed with water and urine cured headaches. Mesquite gum preparation soothed ailing eyes, eased the sore throat, cleared up dysentery, and relieved headaches. Then, yeah. So this is the next one now. Okay, so this is greasewood. So uh, greasewood is also known as black greasewood or chico wood. So sacrobatus is from the Greek sarco, meaning flesh, and batus meaning bramble or fawn, referring to the succulent leaves and spiny branches of the plant. Uh, the family name, um, Chenopodecae, I think it is, uh, translates to goose foot, referring to some members of this family's leaf shape, which resembles the foot of a goose. So greasewood was first collected by John C. Fremont, a famous Civil War veteran, Western explorer, a one-time presidential candidate, and first named by John Tory as Fremontia uh, vermiculatus, until it was discovered that the genus Sarcobatus already existed. So then if I go to how it was used. This is this is major, man, because you know these are uh plants that are in desert areas. So Yeah, so yeah, any of you guys that are living in these type of regions, like I don't know, New Mexico or places like that, then uh, this is your joint right here. Um so man used tough wood for firewood or for tools if a straight enough stem could be found. The hoppy made planting sticks from state stems, and then the uh, Indians ate the seeds and succulent leaves. Like many members of the goosefat family, spinach, kale, Swiss chard, greasewood plants have a somewhat salty flavor. So livestock utilize greasewood for winter and early spring browse. Some wildlife species such as jackrabbits, pronghorns, or prairie dogs forage on the plant. Uh, the kit foxes plug up escape holes of rodents that are buried below the greasewood plant, then proceed to dig out the rodent. Uh, greasewood seeds germinate only in cool temperatures. Uh, this ensures that the seeds get established before the heat of summer. So if greasewood grows in very alkaline soils, high in chloride salts, its leaves are smaller and thicker in size. 
the greasewood may have long root systems that can reach down over 50 feet to groundwater. The next one I wanted to show you guys was the Rio Grande cottonwood. So uh, the Rio Grande cottonwood is also popularly known as the Fremont cottonwood. So it looks like the same guy named this as well. He named it. Uh, common cottonwood, valley cottonwood, marsh cottonwood, alamo, and alamilo. So its scientific name reflects its membership in the poplar family, which includes the poplars, the aspens, and the other cottonwood species. So like many southwestern plants, its scientific name also bears the stamp of John C. Fremont, the famed 19th century pathfinder of the West. So as usual, they come and see your stuff, and then all of a sudden, they got their name on it. Uh, so let's go and I'll show you how this is used. Uh, there we go. So, yeah. So surprisingly, the Rio Grande cottonwood, the water tree, has found a home in south central New Mexico's White Sands National Monument, an environment too harsh for 75% of the plants from the surrounding Chihuahuan Desert. In this area of little annual rainfall, blistering summer heat, relentless spring winds, impoverished soil, and eastward marching sand dunes, the Rio Grande cottonwood has eked out a tortured existence by capturing and securing soil in the interdued flats and extending roots to a relatively shallow water table. So the Rio Grande cottonwood's affinity for water became a metaphor for southwestern Pueblo's reliance on water. So Pueblo carvers shaped the tree's roots the conduit to water into Kachina dolls, spiritual icons of the deeply religious agricultural peoples of an arid land. So originally, carvers took the roots from trees which had been undercut and swept down rivers and streams by floodwaters. Today, as the cottonwoods and riparian forests vanished, carvers must often buy their wood, frequently at exorbitant prices. So the Rio Grande cottonwood's disappearance from the banks of southwestern streams and rivers can now be regarded as a metaphor for our relentless abuse of the environment of the desert southwest. So again, I'll, I'll just show you a quick picture of what the Hopi were using the wood for as well when they were talking about the dolls, because I've seen these dolls before. So these are called Kachina dolls. And that's major, man. Like, yo, I hope, you know, if if anybody is taking notes, I'm be glad you're doing it. And for those who didn't, you know, kind of, kind of go back and make sure you get those plants because you never know where you might go and be able to see these tight trees and plants and maybe get you a little piece of it or something, you know? Yeah, definitely. So they were using the wood, as you can hear from all of these plants. You know, the people are very resourceful, and they were they were using the um, the Rio Grande cottonwood to even make these, which I think these are really beautiful. And they were making they were making these out of the leftovers as well. That's major. Yeah. So even again, when I found that out, I was like, wow, I didn't even know that. Because again, I've seen pictures of these dolls, but I never knew they were made what they were specifically crafted for. So that was that was good to find out as well. Uh, this brings me on to the fringed onion, which looks like this. It's a lilac purple color, or lavender, some might say. So for this part here, uh, yeah. So common perennial bulb, bulb or herb that is native to California and is found only slightly beyond California borders. So the plant has a heavy onion smell and was used by Indians for food. This example was found in great profusion on the gravely and sandy flats in Creosote Bush Scrub of Highway 395 on Highway Power Plant Road, Kern County, California. Okay, so that's the fringed onion. Now here we have the uh, barrel cactus, which is this one here. Uh, I'm sure everybody's seen this one at least once or twice before. So barrel cactus, meaning fierce or wild cactus, are always cylindrical, cylindrical or barrel shaped and are usually among the largest cacti of the North American deserts. Uh, all members of this genus have prominent ribs and are fiercely armed with heavy spines. In some species, one or more central spines are curved like a fish hook, accounting for the common name fish hook barrel cactus. Uh, the barrel cactus flowers always grow at the top of the plant, 
They bear no spines and only a few scales. Fruits become fleshy and often juicy when mature, but are not usually considered edible. So the Indians boiled young flowers in water to eat like cabbage and mashed older boiled flowers for a drink. They also used the cactus as a cooking pot by cutting off the top, scooping out the pulp and inserting hot stones together with food. The spines were used as needles, as awls and in tattooing. So that's where you get your tattoos from. Uh, the pulp of barrel cactus has been widely used for making cactus candy. Uh, thus, one of its common names, candy barrel cactus, but this has also accounted for its destruction and therefore protected status in many areas. Uh, in an emergency, the pulp of the stem can be chewed for its food and water content, but obvious care must be taken during such an operation. The taste can vary greatly depending on species. So the Indians refer to all species of barrel cactus as bisnaga, bisnaga, and bisnaga. So there are a number of species of this genus, most of which grow in central Mexico and major California. Four species are recognized growing in the deserts of the American Southwest. So again, that was the barrel cactus. So it's edible and it can be used to actually cook other food as well. So again, it comes with many uses. And then this last one here that I thought that was of interest. This is the century plant. So this unique native plant has a tall thin stalk from 10 to 14 feet high that grows from a thick basil rosette of gray green leaves. Uh, the leaves are 10 to 18 inches long with long, sharp terminal spines and shorter spines along the edges. The stalk can be up to four inches in diameter. So members of the Amaryllis family, century plants take many years to flower, although not a century. The century plant provided the Indians with a source of soap, food, fiber, medicine and weapons. So uh, agave americana can grow up to 40 feet high with much longer leaves and larger stalk. This American century plant is sometimes grown in Southern California as an ornamental. So it is used commercially in Mexico as a source to produce the liquors tequila, polque, and mezcal. So this is an ingredient in, um, in your tequila, your tequila shots. This is a cider, this plant right here. Um, yeah, just to go back to the, the first page I came across of this. So you guys can go to desertusa.com and then you can go to the desert plant section and then here you've got your subcategories. You've got wildflowers, you've got the cactus and succulents and you've got your trees, shrubs and grasses. So it's like I'll click on that. It takes me down to here. And then let's say I want desert and I just click on that. Break it down, it'll tell me about what family it belongs to, how it grows, what it was used for, and so forth. Now that's that's that was just, I mean, that was all right there, man, because like you say, to 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 know the usage of, of these plants and to know that okay, we even got plants growing in a desert, you know what I'm saying? I don't think I ever too much seen different types of plants when they showed the Sahara or anything like that. Not, no. to be, not to be going against like I'm trying to down that or nothing, but I'm just saying, you know, like we, we you right, know, well, yeah. yeah, you know, well, what you're saying is true, it's, it's true. Um, it, there's not a great deal of desert vegetation, I mean. I, I might build on this later on and see if I can find, you know, more varied species of vegetation in the African desert compared to uh, America. But I don't even think I'd have to really <laughs> research it for too long, more than five minutes, because <laughs> I'm out there, you know. Um, of course, they've got the, the, the palm trees out there, because I've been, I've been across the Sahara Desert on Camelback when I was out in Chilisco. And um, I don't remember seeing you know, any great vegetation diversity on that camel trek. Nothing that you would find in the Americas. So that's even to show you as well, even your desert terrain is not the same as theirs. It's just two completely different worlds. So, you know, two completely different people. You know, the people are a reflection of the environment. The same way that you have two different types of deserts, you have two different types of melanated people. Like nature literally is trying to show you every day that there are differences, you know, in all of us. That's right, man, and, and and that's 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 what ecology shows, and I I think that's why a lot of mainstream scientists and 
you know, uh, people who want to control the narrative, they, they really stay away from that. You know what I'm saying? They don't, they'd rather take it to a religious ideology before they actually look at the land and look at what's actually taking place as far as, you know, on an environmental level. You know what I'm saying? And you got, you got, you know, you 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 might catch like the History Channel or National Geographic, but they're not. You're not gonna see it in a sense where okay, uh, you know, it's more going on over here than over there because the narrative that they give you, you know, you are already conditioned most of the time. They're showing you something in Africa or something anyway. But lately, I've been catching some American. Uh, you know, history and, and, and geographical studies on, on TV, you know, for some odd reason. But uh <laughs> yeah, usually, usually they give you a lot of uh you know African stuff, man. And this this just goes to show, you know, even with the evolution thing, um if they, if it was more based off ecology, you know what I'm saying, the study of the plants and, and the environment, you know, really taking it geographically on that level then it uh, you know stuff is a lot more clear but when you tie institutionalized doctrinations and you want to mix in your religious views you know it it it, 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 come, it it really takes away from how we can just simply identify what's what's taking place so yeah and i mean it's, it's i mean i can speak for the council it's like this is really you know, interesting and it's really enjoyable and exciting for us to just uh, be able to just delve through all of this stuff because, like I said, um, the, the information of the Americas here is very limited. I mean, I, you've probably come across this image, and most people in the chat have the, the emblem of America, you know, the copper colored woman with the yeah. bow and arrow and the sandals. That, that I just found out recently that picture is in the British Library electronic archive. <laughs> so they've always known. And of course they would, like, why wouldn't they? Because the British were one of the first to heavily go over into the Americas. But I mean, if you grew up and lived here, you'd think that wasn't the case because they never speak about the Americas here. It's almost like they never went. And that's the name of the game. Uh, the people don't talk about the Americas, but we have to remember they, their elite brainwashed their people as well to forget things. So most people here just think, oh, an Indian, that they think of a place Mongol, you know what I'm saying? But like, if you know stuff, then you know stuff. Like right? the the tobacco store Indians, they were first used in England in the 19th century because basically the English were very illiterate even as far back as then. That I let you know, you know, they couldn't have been these overpowered slave masters if they couldn't read and write properly. Still, as you know, as as soon as the 19th century, which wasn't that long ago, and they needed the cigar store Indians so that people could navigate, you know their day-to-day -day lives properly. So they knew that if they saw an Indian outside the store, they knew that's where they get tobacco from. If right. they saw that little, um, that little, that little swiveling um, pylon thing, the red and white thing, they know that's where I go to get my hair cut. Like these were things that were actively having to be put into their society to compensate for their lack of, you know, linguistic comprehension. So, um, so I just find it funny that, you know, they, they had, there was once a point in time where I would have, if I was here, you know, if I jumped in a DeLorean and went back in time, these people would have had our people, statues of our people outside every tobacco shop. And now all of that's gone, man. It's like it almost never existed here. Mm. And that's and, uh, Yeah, it's like man. literally my, uh, my only experience of American Indians was my granddad, um, my paternal granddad, because my dad's family are from St. Lucia, like another island. Um, much, much smaller than Yamakura. Whenever I was sick from school, I always used to get dropped off there to stay with him and my grandmother. And uh, he was always in his favorite armchair watching John Wayne and stuff like that. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and again, it's like, why would an African be so interested in the Wild West? <laughs> right. That's right. Man. <laughs> and everyone was good. Like, um, I always think to myself, why is Granddad watching these, these boring Westerns for? Why does he like that? You know? Because as a child, I didn't really understand. But that was his thing. He loved the Westerns, and naturally now I know why. But um, yeah, and then obviously that was my first interaction with seeing a, a so-called Indian, a Plains Mongol. And even as young as I was then, uh, the first thing I always asked myself was, well, why do they look like Asian people? But you know, 
you, you don't expand on these thoughts because you know the other things that are being shoved in front of you but that's literally the first thing i thought when i saw them i was like these people look asian like, why are they american why are they asian um which is very yeah. you know as a child it's just um i find your child years are your best years for comprehension because um uh, it, it's sad to say but children are outdoing us in terms of the comprehension levels you know right because um, I, I work in a school um the teaching assistant so obviously there's every different so-called nationality and ethnicity of children in the school and, uh, one of them she uh, it was a, a girl it's a class i was in last year um, she's from nigeria so she you know she said to me oh sir where are you from so i told her where i was from and then she said, oh, I thought you was from Nigeria. And I said, oh, really? Why is that? And she said, I don't know. And I was like, um, OK, well, uh, put it this way. Um, is there anybody in your family who looks like me? So she thought about it. And then she answered. She said, oh, no, sir, there isn't. So I said, OK, well, then that means I'm not from Nigeria, isn't it? So then she nodded her head and she said, yes. So then I said, you know. <laughs> it's as simple as that, you know. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> Just as simple as that. You know what I'm saying? The and uh, time. them times as well. Uh, that that particular time, I, I still had my hair out. I hadn't started braiding it because it was still a little bit short. And the, another boy came into the conversation, and I kid you not, he said, "Oh, sir, doesn't look like you. He looks like Michael Jackson. He has an afro. He doesn't look like you." You know, and she, this is why I love children. This is why I love working with children because they're just they're just intelligent beings. They're not stupid. Like you can't pull game on them. Right. They ain't got a lot of time to, to you know block block their own intuition. Yeah, and uh, they and so it it does amuse me that children can uh they can understand this very well when you put it within um a suitable context for them to you know understand, but. You know, right. you know, seeing plenty of adults that are still struggling over simple things like a, 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 a color, a color where you can literally look in the mirror tonight and you know you're brown, but you're going to fight so hard to not be that, you know. And children just, you know, children understand their primary and secondary colors better than you. Like it's, it's not acceptable. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> and then, and then not only that, but take something that doesn't even apply on a lawful level and make it spiritual you know like to go by black you know on a personal uh uh private level i can understand wanting power as far as being unity or yeah. having unity with that but when you speak it to any other ethnic group or any foreign opposition, you got to state who you are correctly. And calling yourself black when you know you're not black and you don't look black. I happen to be dark myself, but I'm not black. I'm I'm yeah, like a, I'm like I'm like the old penny more so of. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> it still ain't black. Now it might be a little 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 you know some smudge on it or something, you know what I'm saying? But I ain't, I ain't tar black, you know what I'm saying? But we just, you know, it's, 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 you can't, you can't turn something like that publicly spiritual, but you can keep it, you know, privately spiritual amongst you and your peers. And I think that's just something that a lot of those people who want to identify as that, because I identified as that myself too, because I didn't always know who I was. And yeah. I can, that's why I can understand it. But when you get down to the get down and what you really want to stand for, you got to really people need to know that that is not a term that is going to represent you at all. So. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, you, you have two eyes and two ears for a reason. And you can look at the uh, uh, you can you can look at the darkest uh, so-called African person. And the darkest American person, it doesn't matter if it's North, South or Central, and they're still not the same shade of brown and neither of them look black still at the darkest tint within their respected ethnic group. That's right. So, you know, it, it, the signs are always there around us. Like uh, you have to embrace, you have to embrace the, 
the, the clear cut signs that are around you. If you wish to progress and do better, you, you must be um, an open canvas all the time, every day. You can't um, you can't be an open canvas one day, but you want to cherry pick on Friday. It doesn't really work like that. You have to go the whole way. Exactly. Man. You can't be like, oh well, um, you know, I, I'm I'm the first man and woman, but I'm black. You know, it. You just got rid of you know the first thing you said because that's what these things are designed to do. Like that's terms right. like black and African, and they're designed to scrub out whatever you attach them to as a pre as a prefix. As soon as you put black or African onto anything as a prefix, you're decimating whatever comes after the word. That's so right. You can't say, oh, I'm a black Indian. Okay, well, you, now you're just black now because they're just going to say, okay, well, you're just an Indian that came by way of Africa. You see, yeah. so now the Indian aspect of that black Indian word is gone. That's right, man. And, and I totally agree, man. That's why, you know, it's just some things we got to just make sure we stay intact with and, and, and keep pushing forward, man, because our children have to know this type of information because, I mean, it, it, it'll only be useless for them to fall right back into, you know, saying that they're black. You yeah. know what I mean? It's just, it's just, it's just not, that's not going to be a good look for us to be utilizing our times, you know, building and, and, and spreading this info and our children get old enough to take care of themselves and telling everybody that they're black. I mean, I don't know about anybody else, but I know you, me, you know, Shia, AP, Corey Mayo, you know, A1, and, and your crew, Lacuno, the son, DJ Gambler. We not finna, we're not finna go out like that. <laughs> <laughs> not this team, bro. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that'll be so embarrassing. Like, you know, no, I shout out to the council, man, because yeah, like this. Yeah, I'm talking about if my if one of my children do it, y'all gonna see us in a boxing match to that <laughs> game <laughs> to prove what me. <laughs> you know, embarrass me like that. Hey, because no. um, we we have to start, you know, um, every day just making things known because i tell you what though i'll give you a joke like um, uh, i i actually purchased a redskins um like um drafter hat like winter hat because it's cold out here at the moment and i bought one online uh gambler let me use his ebay account so expect a gambler for that <laughs> and i'll wearing it i'll be wearing it all this week and uh one of the guys one of the parents there he has a he has a boy in my class and um this boy is uh, his mother is european from Poland. And um, his father is, you know, allegedly American. By when I say American, I mean, in, uh, you know, a European who came into America and then became an American. So mm -hmm. he still has the accent, and he saw my hat. He was on a school trip, and then he said, "Oh, um, on Tuesday he was on a school trip." And then he said, "Oh, are you a Redskins fan?" So I just lied and said, "Yeah." And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "Oh, yeah, I grew up as a Redskins fan." <laughs> And then I said, okay, that's great. And then he said, oh, yeah. And then he kind of had a pause. And he said, oh, but the, the, the local's kind of racist, though. So I just played dumb and said, oh, really? Why is that? And um, he said, oh, well, there's a big thing going on in North America right now with the Redskins logo. It's, it's apparently meant to be very offensive to Native people because of the word Redskin. So I said, that's really interesting, you know, because back home where I come from, people call each other red all the time, every day. Red man, red woman, red boy or red girl, you know. Right. Red just means brown because red is brown and brown is red. So, you know, essentially, if you're brown, you are red. That's right. Then, <laughs> he just kind of just, you know, said, oh, yeah, I think it's something to do with the indigenous people. I don't know. And then he just kind of left the conversation alone. But that's how you have to be. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, you can't right. be giving people passes because they'll just play on what they think you don't know or what you don't understand. And mm -hmm. sometimes these people don't understand as well. And it's not just people within your own so-called species of people. I'm talking about everyone's been lied to. So we need clarity. You know, um, you just have to be active every day with it. And just if people slip up, you have to hold them accountable for it. Like, okay, well, that's not entirely true because of so on and so on. That's right. 
and that's exactly right. right man. This is what we just try to do now as a, as, as a council. We just try to be very active when we're out and about and just try and just make people know what's what now. Um, shout out to, uh, to Chief Inca, to the coroner, because, you know, he, he recently just got back from Yamaka himself. He was out there for two weeks. And, you know, he made his own T-shirts to take out there, showing the Carib Indians and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, he was tearing Word. it up, man. Yeah, yeah. Word. Shout out to <laughs> the <Lakota>, man. That's <laughs> what's up. Hey, y'all, hey, man, I don't care, man. I, hey, real recognize real, man. That's a thorough brother right there, dog. You hear me? That that brother that ain't playing no games. I'll tell hey, you, I'll <laughs> tell you, man. Hey, man, this is what it's about, man. Hey, I, I mean, and, and I, I did want you to at least hit on resourceful because I, I didn't I didn't want to hold you too long, man. I know you got stuff you gotta do and stuff, but I did want you to just touch on that and we can even do a part two, man, if you want, man. Yeah, so we can hit on some of the other stuff that we came up with and just kind of ended up with the uh you know uh question and answer maybe just from from the viewers or something, man, on the next one, man. So we can get a little bit more interaction. Cause we pretty oh, much just held it down, man, and it was a great bill, man. But if you would kind yeah. of touch on that, man, and and I, like I say, I don't want to hold you up. We can always do a part two if you want, or if yeah, you just want to kind of just, man, we can make this just a little, try to you know something that we could just keep up. Like I say, one day we get me, you, Cormeo, uh, you know, uh, Lacono, the son, and probably. Uh, a few more people on, on my end or whoever, who are, who are we can get, man, and really put put together a nice show, man. Get Gamla to, 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 to have some music, you know what I'm saying? We can <laughs> put yeah. some stuff together, man. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we, I'm really trying to keep it going to where we, you know, connecting with more and more people, man, across the land. So, you know, if you don't mind, man, you know, just just hanging with me, man, and and, and just stick with us, bro. So, but yeah, bro. touch on what you, whatever you need, man. Before you know, All right. um, just before I get into that, uh, Lacona just asked, like, do you, do you want to come on Lacona Corner tonight? Because we're going to be streaming from his channel after this. Sure, man. Uh, just uh, just send me I'll the link. You the, uh, when he when he sets up the panel, I'll I'll hit you the panel link on Hangouts. Yeah, just do that because um. I, if anything, I'll be able to jump in on my phone or something like that and just be able to chop it up. And because I'm a, I know you'll be out for a little bit, but other than that, nice. yo, we we, we, right. we can do it. And if and if they want to come on the panel next time just to you know fill out the show, because you know, we I know we the you really I know you really wanted to turn kind of touch on trees and um pretty much that's you know i'm not because i really want you to get on that too but we could definitely do that man and just get them yeah um, no doubt we'll yeah. definitely do that we'll, we'll, we'll bring a few more faces on definitely yeah. so um my part in peace will be uh from this book um betrayal of the buffalo ranch by uh sarah sue uh Hocklotop. and this is a very short passage there, there was one i wanted to get from you guys but it won't let me open it up in the preview properly so i'll rock with this one um so um let's see yeah there we go okay so um so as he drove out of the Buffalo Ranch, Lance let his truck slow to a stop so he could appreciate the grandeur of several bison and a calf grazing in the distance. So Lance fought the magnificent animals and embodied the struggle for survival of all American Indians. So the people had used every inch of the buffalo for something, from the hide, the meat, and the bones, to the hair, the horns, and the innards. When Indians harvested a buffalo, absolutely nothing went to waste. Uh, so in fact, what the Indians were actually doing, they were using um, the buffalo um, to make glue, to make hair extensions, um, yeah, making all kind of things. I, I will, I will get a proper plug for you guys next time round. Um, but um, there's one more book I want to show you guys, which is this one. 
this is a little passage from here. So this is Slavery and the Evolution of Cherokee Society, 1540 to 1866 by Vida Perdue. Um, and then here it says, uh, at first the Cherokees bought only a few kinds of goods from the white traders. Uh, the Cherokees certainly did not require the tools of the white man to exist, for the Indians' knowledge of and ability to exploit their environment enabled them to live comfortably in a land where vast technological superiority did not permit the Europeans to escape a hard struggle for survival. James Adair noted the red man's remarkable adaptability. If an Indian were driven out into the extensive woods with only a knife and a tomahawk, or even a small hatchet, it is not to be doubted he would fatten even where a wolf would starve. He could soon collect fire by rubbing two dry pieces of wood together, make a bark hut, earthen vessels, and a bow and arrows. Then kill wild game, fish fresh water tortoises, gather plentiful varied variety of vegetables, and live in affluence. So again, just to show you that, um, you know, they're saying, you know, where the typical, you know, creature of the wild would perish. If the Indian was put in the same situation as the wolf, the Indian would prevail and come out, you know, unscathed. Because, you know, they were in tune with the environment. Everything would, everything had a role to play as something for the Indian's benefit. Because, you know, they, they are the environment and the environment is them. And that's the same for the people, but you know, the people just don't realize that. You know, obviously, if you live in apartment blocks and you're looking at skyscrapers or you've been you know, physically removed off the land now and you're living in a, a foreign place now, then um, you're going to lose that connection as each generation goes by. The further you're away from home, the harder it's going to get you know, for you to really have that, that connection. But, uh, that's right. That's right. That's what I find personally. I think. Um, I think it's done a lot for our people psychologically being here like three, four generations now and um, we're, we're spending more and more time disconnected physically from the land and I think it does play a huge role in um, identity. I think when you're physically attached to the land, I think it does something to you. I, I can't explain it, but uh, when you're not and your your feet are rooted on a foreign land, you you have no relation to it and it's like you're, you're forcing your soul and your natural energy to try and be a part of it. And I think that's why our people are so erratic over here right now, which is very misguided and you still don't have a clear direction of what we're meant to be doing. And that's deep, man, because you know it's is 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 for for you know your people, you know what I'm saying? Um it's, it is a, a, a actual situation of you know, actual serving. To, to 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 actually you know not necessarily like you serving under some type of master and that but y'all really you know you, your grandpops they you know, really had to get on the grind and provide a way man and leaving for the people here in america's you know a lot of us was literally detached mentally you know what i'm saying but you and the people over there in the uk a lot of y'all you know that that are from the Caribs or just from the Americas. Period. Actually, got it done physically and mentally. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, and this is another reason why you know um, we're just gonna keep it going because we're definitely gonna um, put together a panel to uh, show the difference between colonized victims who are of. Uh, mixed ethnic groups and then the ones who are victims of war you yeah. know what I'm and, it, and it is a, it's a it's a major difference you know because uh our people you know this is it's one of the ways we lost our ways of being resourceful you know what i'm saying not being able to link completely what has taken place as far as you know, uh, uh, because it was certain, it was certain people, you know, that who may not have been the original look, but did no particular uh, resourceful, resourceful ways. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And yeah. I, it's it's like you know, just because they may be mixed or 
you know, uh, basically victims of, of, of war or indentured servitude, you know, because a lot of uh, a lot of people, even back in the uh, early and late 1700s, were, were being charged for having children under wedlock. And, right. it, and it was going down a lot with the mulatto case. You know what I'm saying? And I'm pretty sure it's probably the same thing in the UK. You know what I'm saying? Just as far as like how things had to go as far as uh, working and dealing with certain people. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I know it was probably more of a, a segregated deal because like you say, uh, Really, a lot of integration didn't come in until what you was like the late, uh, probably what maybe around, yeah, 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 60s or something, you know. So, you know, we, we, we had a period where for at least uh 20 to 30 years, we, we was just you know, it, we were just I was it was just us and ourselves and the, the, the people that brought us here, and um. Yeah, we had that kind of isolation period, but now you know everything is very heavily integrated. Um, in London, you don't really have that um, segregational kind of communities as far as you know a, a city like London goes, or any of the major cities like Birmingham or Manchester. Um, of the further north you go, it's more the English faces rather than your own, and your numbers will start to dip a little bit. But I mean, you'd have to go really out to um, mainly the outskirts of England. And that's where you predominantly not see, you know, your copper colored people really, you know, unless they're, you know, um, the sellouts or whatever we want to call them, the lost wayward ones. But um, yeah, so London is a very, um, very mixed, very, very mixed society of different people and cultures across the whole city. And yeah, and like I say, this is just one of those kind of like a, uh, you know, Mandela effect or whatever. And it just goes to show, man, I mean, if you could be way in the UK and learn how to study, you know, being resourceful, you know, uh, looking at the earth and environment, you know what I'm saying? And to actually get the, the attention of the Americas and to, to see how many different variations and styles and stuff like that you know if i if i would have been anywhere else if i would have been in the uk i'd probably be doing the same thing you do on myself just because the information is really is that vast when it comes to the americas and it's just good to know that you know it's people like us everywhere man that that really do care to be resourceful and do care to you know, see how people grow the right way, man. And I just want to say I appreciate that, man. And appreciate you spending this time, man. And anything else you want to kind of lead out with and share before we close out, man? You, you know. um, yeah, just to say thank you, thank you to Jaguar for getting me on here. But we, we, we've been, we've been definitely planning this one for a little while now, so it, it feels good to finally have it over the line. So I really, I really enjoyed this stream, and uh, thank you to everybody that came out on. The, the stream as well to to just hear me out and that's that's love that's appreciation and obviously partly with that say big up the council Gavla, Nakodo, Don, Sword, uh, Dr, uh, Takara, Kita. Um, I might miss nobody out, but if I did, yeah, yeah respect to the council man and. Um, yeah, just respect to everybody from America, man. If you love America and you know that you're from America, man, it's all good, man. That's right, man. And and shout out to everybody, man, that came through. Check this out. You know, um, is we gonna keep it going? We gonna keep it flowing? Um, we still got plenty more to release. Um, you're gonna see me more interacting with Copper High and the Council. And he's going to be interacting more with me and the rest of the fam over here, you know, because we got to unite this thing and make it as one. And we're going to keep it going, y'all. So hang with us, bear with us. Uh, part two will hopefully probably be soon. Uh, I'm going to probably jump in on the Kono's channel 
a little later. So make sure y'all send me that invite and uh, y'all shout out to everybody that came through, man. Um, take a look at the chat right quick. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, Chelsea Smith. Shout out to you, Supreme. DJ Gamalu. What up, King? Aboriginal Truth. You already know, bro. LaSun. Peace Supreme. Keisha Murphy. Priest. Peace. FRZ in the building. <laughs> What's going down, man? Star Strike. Peace, King. Rainstorm always coming through, man. Salute to you, Rainstorm. And Wanagi came through. Shout out to Wanagi, man. And Pet to Waste. I mean, Knock Lab. Shout out to you, King. Hit me up, man. Get with me. Big Bo, Big Bro Joe 47. Shout out to David Clewis. You know what I'm saying? Yo, if I missed anybody, man. Oh, Big Bro Carl. Peace. Peace. Mr. Dark Bro. What's going down, man? Y'all already know the big bros is in the house. And yeah, man, let's 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 keep it going, y'all, man. I appreciate everybody coming out, man. Stay tuned to Copper Hot Step. Subscribe to his channel. Subscribe to everybody in the chat, man. Bump it, man. It's about uniting and sticking together. <laughs> hey, everybody in the chat gonna give you that heat or gonna lead you to a better cause. I already know. It's all fam, man. So, yeah, man. Shout out to you, Copper Hot, man. We're going to keep it going, man. Make sure you send me that link, too, bro. Oh, definitely. As soon as he plugs me the link, you'll be straight in, bro. All right, man. So, peace, y'all, man. We'll be back. Peace. Strength and progression, fam.